Hello and welcome to Bewilder Beasts. I'm your host, Melissa McHugh McGrath, still recording from the tiniest podcast studio outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And today on Bewilder Beasts, we are going to talk about the cutest little toilet plunger thief. We're going to explore the tallest dwarfs in the animal kingdom, and honeybees are using tools to fight back against giant murderous hornets. Team B, rah, rah, rah. All right, let's go. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Bewilder Beasts. I am so excited to have you here today. I'm feeling pretty good today, too, because we've got almost 3,000 downloads for this little podcast, and it's five months old. It's it's a little baby podcast, and we're still kicking. It's all very exciting, and I take that seriously. I take it very seriously that you listen, that you choose to spend time with me. So thank you very much. I ended up making a new website for Bewilderbeast. You can still visit bewilderbeastspod.com. And it will bring you to a new website. And on this website, like you can learn a little bit more about each episode. Some of them have individual art instead of just the logo, which has been fun to make. There's a little bit about what started this podcast, why this podcast, and how you can share this podcast. Clearly, some of you guys are sharing this, and that's how so many people are able to hear about this little show. And I can't thank you enough. If you'd like to visit the website, let me know if there are episodes there that you like. What was your favorite episode? What's the one that you recommend to people? You can support this show if you're like, hey, I really like what you're doing and I'd like to support the show. There's a little link there. And if you know teachers or friends or family members that you think would like this show, it's a little bit more fleshed out now. So you can share that with them. And again, if you are a student listening and you think that your class would like to have a live presentation on any of these animals, or if you think that your teacher would like a little support in the classroom with having somebody else to teach a little bit, maybe a half an hour out of the day, so that way they can also learn about these amazing animals too. If you've noticed that some of the history that you're covering in class is tied into one of these stories and you think that it would be a really good way to help the lesson stick or to help your teacher out, tell your teacher, I will happily for free go and have a conversation on Zoom with the classes. And as this is an all ages show, I can talk to very young students, preschool, kindergarten, first grade, and we can talk about animals that have funny poop like wombats, Um, or if you're in high school and you want to have something that's a little bit more deep and thoughtful, we can talk about racism and Dr. William Key with his horse, beautiful Jim Key, at at the turn of the 1900s, or anti-immigration sentiment with Mrs. O'Leary's cow, or the importance of mental health by talking about Sergeant Stubby. So if there's something in there that you think your teachers would enjoy, go ahead and share this um, website with them and let them know that I am happy if they contact me as a teacher, that I will come and happily talk to the students about any of the animals that have been featured on the show. And with that, let's get on with today's episode. Heather Matilla, right here in my home sweet Massachusetts. She co-authored a paper on a super cool discovery, how honeybees are using tools to defend their nests against giant hornets. And before we talk about the tools that were used, which you definitely want to stick around for, let's first talk about what's happening and why defenses are necessary for the honeybee. So to put it bluntly, Giant hornets are jerks to bees. They are the hornet Thanos to the honeybee avengers. Essentially, these giant hornets will decapitate every single honeybee they meet. Clearly inspired by the old Highlander movies, there can be only one. Or the Queen of Hearts and Alice in Wonderland, off with their heads! It's brutal. They just leave bee bodies and heads scattered where they were killed. The hornets then move into their little murder house of bee horror, and then, in a movie fit for Stephen King, they start eating the larvae. Yep. If removing honeybee heads like some sick Game of Thrones episode wasn't enough, they take their sweet, sweet time eating bee babies. They eat bee babies, y'all. 
these hornets are hardcore villains in the flying insect subgenre of all things just super terrible. The bees, not wanting to take this, had a great way to team up and handle their attackers by creating what scientists and researchers call a hot bee ball. That's a quote. <laughs> Which I first imagined fireballs shooting out of Mario, like uh, when he gets the firepower flower, but instead it is way cooler than that, or rather hotter. You see, dozens to hundreds of Asian honeybees will swarm a single giant hornet and quiver. And while twerking isn't typically a great defense tactic in most of the animal kingdom, as the bees shake it like a Polaroid picture, they generate heat. And this heat is contained inside the ball of bees and essentially boils their attacking giant hornet. Why don't they just sting the hornets? Well, bee stingers are too tiny to pierce through the thick armor that the hornets have, so using this hot ball technique, they have a chance. But they didn't just stop at attacking hornets. They are using a similar technique that most militaries use, tools and hiding in plain sight. The bees are using tools, but first, let's define tool. In this case, it might not be a hammer or a screwdriver or even a stick. Tools in this case are manipulating or using something in a way that that thing might not have been intended. Are you with me so far? Okay, so the groundbreaking use of tools by bees, a tool they are using as a means of repelling hornets who are decapitating them and to camouflage their hive is poop. Because of course it is. You have heard this show before. It's almost always poop. So who else out there is imagining little bees dressed as medieval knights with catapults of crap alight flinging feces at their foe? Or using poop as battle makeup like Braveheart? It's not exactly like that, but I hope someone makes that picture or comic book. The honeybees are using actual crap to decorate their hive entrances in the worst recommended Better Bee Homes and Gardens article of the year. They started adding feces to their entrances after hornets started attacking them, and the hornets spent way less time as a result hanging out in front of these bees' entranceways, even having researchers put pieces of paper that are soaked in the extracts from giant hornet bodies. Perhaps the most disgusting sentence I've ever said, and the worst juice bar idea ever. That was enough to trigger honeybees to start collecting poop from nearby fields and coating their hives in it. Now, it's unclear how this repels hornets, though. While I'm not a scientist, I think it might have something to do with coating in poop. But in all seriousness, it might be that the hornets don't like the smell, or maybe the hornets just don't want to chew through and get their, like, little mandibles on those nests that are covered in dookie as the hornets have to chew through the hive door in order to make the entranceway big enough to fit through in order to finish their insecty version of Mortal Kombat. It also might hide the sweet honey smell of the hide, which might attract the hornets. And dung masking the smell is perhaps the worst twist on the Febreze marketing plan ever. These techniques are only currently observed in Asian honeybees. Unfortunately, the bees here in the United States the European honeybee, has not to our knowledge or observation been able to find a way to defend against the Asian giant hornets. Or murder hornets. Do you remember those guys? They dominated the news cycle for like seven minutes in 2020 before the next big terrible thing came into the news cycle. So why is this important? Well, murder hornets are very closely related to the giant Asian hornets that are repelled by the poo house. And those same hornets are killed by shaking what the bee's mama gave them, creating a fireball of death. But against the European bees, these guys are defenseless. And the European honeybee is the primary pollinator of our food. Do you like apples, grapes, basil, flowers and foliage that go on to feed other animals so they can live? How about wheat for bread, cake and cookies? Broccoli? I mean, not broccoli cookies. Clearly, I should have organized this list better. I've been distracted. But you get the idea. No bees, no food. So farmers, orchard operators, greenhouses, and everyone 
has their eyes on how to save and help these poor defenseless honeybees. And one thing that they might be able to do from this research is apply whatever the substance is that repels the carnivorous hornets as a defense for the bees. And if we can find the substance in poop, that might make it more ideal than asking people to just take poop and smear it on their own beehives. Ugh. Plus, bees are notoriously fastidious and very, very, very clean critters. Meaning, the Asian honeybees might have been able to do this as an act of desperation contrary to their preference. But would the European bees be able to override living in a literal house of poo for survival? Or would the very thing that is applied in order to repel these murder hornets backfire and repel the bees too? And it wouldn't be science if there wasn't the well, actually, moment, one entomologist in the UK said to the National Geographic magazine, probably pushing his glasses up as he was saying it, well, it's a bit of a stretch to say that this is the first demonstration of tool use. <laughs> the species also uses leaves to stain hive entrances, and nests are built from paper, suggesting that these are also manners in which bees use tools. Maybe, but maybe not. While bees use plants and materials to build their nests, it appears most scientists don't call this tool use for the bee. Bob Jean, a wasp expert at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, says, The authors are correct in calling this the first example of a tool use by the honeybee. These researchers are applying a reasonable definition. There is a call for language to be more clear in the definition of what is a tool, it seems like everyone is on board with bees using a material they don't usually use in order to create a defensive tactic for survival that isn't one that is typically noticed. You know, their stingy butt. And if they can manipulate poop to successfully defend their home, I think that's way better than any security camera, ADT subscription, or nest camera, or other home defense. This is a tool, and that is not the argument. The people poo-pooing the technicality of this are really getting stuck on if this is the first case of honeybees using tools. And I think that that's up to the scientists to jump into that crappy conversation to figure out their definition. Regardless, it comes down to the sweet little honeybees using poop as a tool to protect their hive, their babies, their house. And the next time you eat a cookie, think about how a bee using cow patties made that cookie possible. You're welcome. Nature throwing curveballs is my favorite thing. I mean, we've already talked about how nature gives us a glowing bioluminescent beaver with a duck face, a poison spur, and is a mammal that lays eggs. But as if nature could say, but wait, there's more, there are now dwarf Giraffes. Yay! Doesn't this defeat the evolutionary purpose of the giraffe? I am so confused. Go home, nature. You're drunk. I want the confidence of nature on a bender with only spare parts and a deadline. So what are dwarf giraffes and how do they happen? Can we get it and keep it? Can I carry it like a puppy? Well, first, let's talk about what dwarfism is. There are two main kinds of dwarfism. There's disproportionate dwarfism, which is when there's a typical sized torso or a head and smaller limbs. So think of a corgi, our short friends in the dog world with the cutest butts in all of the animal kingdom. Effectively, we humans are breeding for the gene mutation for disproportionate dwarfism in some dogs like the corgi in order to get breeds to look the way that we want them to. And the other is a teacup chihuahua. Their heads might not be the right shape, a little more bulbous and maybe kind of too big in proportion to the rest of its body. Their legs are bowed. They're not really put together in the healthiest way. The parts are all there, but they are not proportional to the shape and size of what we are used to seeing in domestic dogs. And if you compare that to proportionate dwarfism, think of it if someone just took a giraffe, but then on Google Images just zoomed in and out. All the pieces stayed in proportion to the rest of the giraffe. It was just shrunk by 40%. 
If you were to see a big photo or a small photo, it would still look like a regular giraffe that you had seen on Nat Geo, in nature books, and in every book that says G is for giraffe. Dwarfism is incredibly rare, no matter how you cut it. And if we were to look at either kind of dwarfism on its own, it would be even more rare. So the fact that this occurred in wild giraffes in Namibia and Uganda in only two cases ever documented, that indicates that it's not going to be likely a gene that will continue to pass on. That's evolution. Sometimes you get a hit, sometimes you get a miss. So two dwarf giraffes, the first such animals known to science, and they are still nine feet tall. These giraffes fell into this category, the category of disproportionate dwarfism. They looked like somebody took a 16-foot giraffe, kept the torso and the head basically the same size, squished the long skinny legs into shorter, chunkier legs. The torso looked like they were getting super swole in a fitness club as their chest muscles bulged out in a weird way. And while they were still nine feet tall, hardly a dwarf to us, they are certifiably considered pocket pals in the giraffe community. Because standard giraffes, they are between 16 and 18 feet tall. It turns out, while the headlines of, quote, dwarf giraffes exist, they were shared over and over and over on social media with these images of these really amazing creatures. And there are some assumed updates. Both of the giraffes photographed were males, and apparently they did make it to an adult age or almost to adult age, which would be surprising given that they have a significant disadvantage for eating tall food and evading prey. Those long legs help giraffes run away from predators like lions and hyenas, leopards, and African wild dogs. Unsurprisingly, their shorter legs may have made up their chances of escaping predators much worse, as biologists haven't seen the Ugandan giraffe since 2017. It's been four years since they've had a sighting. And the Namibian giraffe? The last time we saw him was in July of 2020. So yes, dwarf giraffes do exist. No, you cannot keep them. They are still barely taller than two Danny DeVitos, half the size of a standard giraffe, and you could fit a stack of 10 of them on top of each other in a standard bowling lane. No, they likely will not be, quote, a thing. This is an example of nature making choices, and some choices are better than others. But I implore you all to go look up photos of these dwarf giraffes. You can see them in the resources in the episode notes of this episode, or just Google this amazing discovery. Y'all, I don't have a TikTok, but I would consider getting one just for this. Follow the account at Beaver Baby Furry Love. And yes, this is an all ages show. It's totally innocent. It's the account of a licensed, and I feel that this cannot be highlighted enough, a licensed Department of Environmental Conservation licensed rehabber. So this rehabber helps rehabilitate wildlife to get them back out into the wild. They limit contact with humans and provide medical care, food, shelter, and make sure animals have the skills to survive on their own, defend themselves, survive in the wild. And many of the animals that she gets are for a span of just a couple of days to maybe a few months. That's typical. What makes this particular story fascinating is all that went totally out the window when she decided to help rehabilitate beef. A baby beaver who was likely orphaned after his family was poached as baby beavers are not ever seen without their parents. Beavers stay with their families for two years, and the parents teach them everything about survival. And this, this is not hyperbolic. They teach them how to eat, what to eat, etc. Beavers don't eat by trial and error like a lot of animals do. They have to be taught. And as a result, baby beef had to be taught how to eat wild vegetation after coming off a bottle. So this rehabilitator had to hand feed him roughage. And it takes a long, long time to teach baby beavers even to do the basics like eating. And so this licensed rehabber, not 
just some guy who picked up a wild beaver to make as a pet. They had to make a choice. Do I take on this two to three year commitment to teach this baby boy everything and let him steal all of the things to build dams in our kitchen, chew our furniture, all of it? Or do we find someone else to do this job for us? He needed care. He needed help. He needed someone who would be willing to let a beaver make a Lincoln Log beaver dam in their living room. And after a lot of consideration, she said yes. Now, the TikTok channel and YouTube channel associated with Beave, Raising the Wild on YouTube, if you're curious, is the oxytocin that you need today. Just log in and watch this baby beaver use the doggy door, waddle through the house, and drag a toilet plunger down the stairs so he can make his own setup. My kid used to do this when she was small. She'd have all of her things in a pile. She would say, don't move my setup. I couldn't touch it. My husband couldn't touch it. If we moved it, we would get yelled at. Don't touch Beeve's setup. He even had piles around the house of blocks, plungers, cushions, sticks from outside, bright pink unicorn stuffies, building blocks, all of it set up as a dam at the bottom of her stairs. But for now, Beeve is working hard. He even has a pond behind the rehabber's home, and he's building a real dam. And as he gets closer to maturity and he starts looking for a mate, he will become more aggressive to people, which is normal. This is a wild animal. He is not a domestic pet. And when he does start to become aggressive, this family will start to step back more and more, reduce human interaction. And one day, if we're lucky, he just won't be in the pond anymore. He will be off looking for his own life partner, his own furry beaver buddy. And while all stories like this do come to an end, as will beeves with this family, this is what rehabbers do. They work so hard to say goodbye. No hard feelings. But the good news is that Beave is going to live on forever on the internet as a teacher about all things wildlife. And oh my god, he's so cute. So get thee to the interwebs. Check out Beave the Beaver, and maybe it will inspire you to learn about how you can help wild animals in your area safely. And it might even inspire you to maybe interview a rehabilitator or to see what it is that they do on the daily. This work is hard and it is important, but that doesn't mean that you can pick up a wild animal and call yourself a rehabber. There is a process and there's a lot to learn. The biggest thing is saying goodbye. So instead, you could do what I do. Sit for six hours after a long day with a cup of cocoa, zone out to the squeaking, chewing, nibbling sounds of baby beef, dragging a toilet plunger around this beautiful house straight out of Better Homes and Gardens. So thank you for joining me today on Bewilder Beasts. If you like this podcast, share and tell all your friends. It's truly the best way to support this show. Go to bewilderbeastpod.com for all of the previously recorded episodes, info about the show, and other ways that you can help support and learn about these amazing creatures and more. If there are topics you would be interested in hearing about on the podcast, know of any historical animals who have changed the world, animals who help humans, wacky animals in the news, or teachers who want a little break and have a visitor come in and talk about cool animals, hit me up. There are multiple ways to send in questions or let me know what you think of the show. Email bewilderbeastspod at gmail.com. Tweet at bewilderbeastpod, DM or voice text on bewilderbeastpod on Facebook, or just lurk at bewilderbeasts on Instagram. My name is Melissa McHugh McGrath. I'm a certified professional dog trainer, co-training director of the New England Dog Training Club, author of Considerations for the City Dog, and creator of this podcast. Now go get curious. I got today's information from mymodernmet.com on Beef the Beaver, mashable.com, verywellhealth.com on dwarfism, mashable.com on dwarf giraffes, the Mayo Clinic on dwarfism, link.springer.com, npr.org, tiktok.com, at beaverbabyfurrylove. 
nationalgeographic.com, and sciencealert.com. Links, as always, are in the description of today's episode. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Leibowitz, and interstitial music is by MK2. Don't forget to like, subscribe, review, and share with your curious friends. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you next week. Thank you.